come to my talk, I'm going to talk about parsing as language modeling, which is a joint work with my, uh, with my advisor, Eugene. Can you hear you? Yeah. Okay. Can you? Uh, okay. Can you hear me now? No. 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 <laughs> Can you hear me now? No. Okay. Now, um, can you? Okay. I'm DK. Um, I will jump into the conclusion first. Um, it's very simple. You take a uh, LSA language model and train on sequential trees. So the pantry bank annotation, if you look into the pantries, then you get a very strong uh, parser record. All of you know well about LSTM, so I'm not going to go into detail what they do, but they are very powerful. They show still the art results everywhere. <laughs> um, so we are going to do language modeling. Language modeling is a statistical system that assigns a probability to any sentence, and that's what we want to do with trees. We want to, we want to have a model that assigns probability to trees. The way the language models um, model the probability of sentences is that they break it down into the conditional probabilities and multiply them all at the end. And this is the chain rule. Once you have a model trained on lots of uh, sentences, then you can tell good sentences from bad, uh, from bad sentences by looking at their probabilities. And this is exactly what we're going to do with parsing. So here's an example how you actually can compute the probability of sentence. I assume all of you know well about this, but um, bear with me. Given a sentence, Eugene wears a bow tie, you go from left to right as you consume a word and try to predict the probability of the next word from left to right. Once you get to the end, you just multiply all the word probabilities, which is the uh, sentence probability. Here, I omitted the conditional event for the clarity, but you can imagine the they are actually modeling the conditional probabilities. So back to parsing, given a sentence x and the syntactic structure y, you turn it into a sequential representation z, then you can just apply language models. Once you have a trained model, you can find the most likely tree by finding the most uh, highest probability over sentence and syntactic structure. So the only missing part is how we uh, represent tree Z in linear fashion or sequence fashion. Um, if you go look at pantry bank, the bottom trees are you're gonna, what, uh, what you're going to see. Um, except that I'm not going to use past tags and I disambiguate the close parents with their matching uh, labels. To get the bottom representation from the top, you just need to traverse the tree from um, left to right and depth first. So you start with S, that's how you get the first symbol S, and then you go to NP, because NP is the first child, and then you go to Eugene, and comes back to NP, like finishes the NP node, and you repeat this process until you get back to S node at the end, and that closes this whole constituent. So this is representation that I trained uh, our language model on. And for the clarity in the next example, I'm just going to remove all the open parens and I'll replace all the closed parens with a uh, single bracket. And same thing with language modeling, just longer sequence. You go from left to right as you go through, estimate the probability of the next symbol. And when you get to the end, you multiply all this word in this grammar language and multiply them all. So S and P, or like close bracket, will be the word in this language. Unfortunately, we don't have an algorithm that actually searches through the exponentially large tree space. So what we are going to do is that is we take a parser that generates list of trees, and then we use a ranker, which can assign the ranker here is a uh, LSTM language model trained on sequential trees. The ranker can assign any tree probabilities now, so you're going to output the tree that has the highest probability according to the director. So some numbers, we use three layers of LSTMs, 1500 dimensional word embeddings and hidden units, standard softmax, and truncated propagation through time with 
fetch size at 20 and step size 50. This thing fits on one GPU and training takes about 12 hours on a small data set and 68 hours on a larger data set. Small data set is a entry bank data set of uh, Wall Street Journal section. It's a little less than 40,000 sentences. And for self-training or try training whatever you call, we use 11.2 million trees to um, improve our reactor. So results. Um, I used Eugene's parser as a base parser that provides in this list, and that starts with 89.7. And if you use Mark Johnson's ranker on top of Eugene's parser, that number goes up to 91.5. And if we replace Mark Johnson's ranker with our new ranker, the number goes up to 92.6, uh, which is really hard. The top three systems are neural net based parsing models that came out recently. And if we just scale it up, so we train our ranker on 11.2 million trees in addition to the Wall Street Journal trees, we get a better ranker. We also train Charnier parser on all the trees we had, that was like 24 million trees, and Charnier parser goes up to 91.2. Surprisingly, you can just take Charnier parser on the web and train on 24 million trees in a day. Um, and if you use them together, the number goes up to 93.8, still the art, as far as I know. And a interesting comp comparison we can do is we can actually compare our system to humans. So you can you convert the constituency trees into dependent trees and measure the accuracy. This um, this this dependence parser we compare is the still the R dependence parser from Google, and we do substantially better than the dependency parser system. It may suggest there is something to learn from the constituency parse trees that the dependent, dependence trees are missing. But we don't really know why you can take it in your paths with, with better. And we can also compare to human experts. So the number here is the inner annotator agreement when you ask annotator, uh, linguists to annotate the trees. That's around 96 and 97, according to Google. Um, for this, I would say we are very close to humans and given the progress we are making in the field and that fact that we are very close to humans, uh, I would say we are going to solve pentribin parsing in a year or two. <laughs> but other things are not, not going to solve in one year. Um, so <laughs> we didn't do much analysis, but uh, I know one source of error. So the Eugene's parser doesn't give us the correct tree 100% of the time, and because of that, our ranker cannot find that correct tree. So the experiment I did was I include the correct tree into Eugene's list, uh, Eugene's best list, and we rank them and evaluate them. So the best list we use is 50 best, and the Oracle list 51 star is the one that shows us the hypothetical for bound of our ranker's performance. The number here don't exactly match from the uh, previous slide numbers because these are on the depth set. But the point here is that if you had Oracle and best list, we could do much better. And the other thing to note here is that once the N is substantially large, uh, say 50, we don't get uh, any performance improvement. They do contain better trees, but they also introduce lots of noise because the well, this is fairly big if you go to like 500. So back to the summary, just take a LSTM language modeling code on the web, you train it on Pantry Bank, then you have the studio art director. The coding models are available web, uh, hit this URL. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for a very interesting paper. Uh, a couple of questions. Yep. So one is, at least in the talk, you just talked about just having a left to right uh, model. But of course, since the strings are fixed, you could have a, you could easily have a bidirectional language model in there too. So that's, that's one question. And where do you think that would make any difference? Another issue is, are you using any of the features that we used in the earlier Ranker, in no. particular even Eugene's Pass score? 
No. So do you think it would be interesting to try and combine them with the? the I think it would be LSD interesting. Scores? Yeah. It would be interesting to try the parsing score from the Eugene's parser and features that you use to. Yeah, yeah. Um, it should be easy to do because yeah. you're producing a lot of probability at the yeah. end of the day. Yes, it is. Uh, but we didn't try them because the result was really good and the model we used was really simple. Yeah. So this should be the, I think this should be the baseline model for uh, future constituency uh, parsing models. And this model is like super extendable. You could try um, character or embeddings, or you can just scale it up by throwing in more GPUs, or make model size bigger. So we tried to make it as simple as possible. But yes, we could try more features. Yeah, I really like the simplicity of it. But I, so I have, I have a question that's uh, similar in spirit to the question that I asked earlier. So I just double checked, and um, if I give, say, the Stanford Core NLP parser the sentence, DK Gorps a Blick Foo, it gets the parse exactly correct, the same as Eugene wears a bow tie. <laughs> um, what would your system do? Depending on what Eugene's parser gave, uh, gives me, if there's no correct tree, then it's not going to do anything right, but well. But suppose the correct tree is in there. Then I assume it's going to pick it up. Okay. Well, I don't know. I tried on buffalo buffalo sentence. Yeah. Eugene's person doesn't find the correct tree in the list, and yeah. I couldn't do anything. But so, I, I, so I guess the tenor of the question, right, is that is that you've got something in there that's doing its re-ranking that's, um, the training is heavily dependent on the lexical items, because they're part of the linearization of the tree, yeah. right? Um, so part of what uh, these, the parsers do for you um, is enable you to go uh, and, and generalize beyond specific lexical items, so that to answer Anna's question, why would you care about this? Um, uh, if you're parsing patents or, or clinical records or you know other stuff, um, you, you, you might actually care. So this this you know train test split or cross validation on the same data set is a, diverges from what happens in the real world a lot of the time. So um, I think it would be interesting to explore again, same as the guys that comment previously, right? Um, yeah how, to what extent this is generalizing, okay. since a lot of what people have done prior to these approaches is geared toward identifying elements of the representation um, uh, that actually generalize for a theoretical and for linguistic reasons. So I have one generalization number, so I took the parser trained on the Wall Street Journal news articles and the Giga World, uh, like New York Times news articles, and evaluated on the brown corpus, and the F1 was around 90, even though he wasn't trained on any of those. Uh -huh. So I think it generalized fairly well. Good, yeah, I think more, more exploration like that. Great, thanks. Okay, so uh, I like the updated uh, filter. So I'm kind of curious um, to what extent can we improve it by thinking about the uh, way train read uh, are linearized. So we have seen before, uh, like 10, 20 years ago even, uh, that if you um, add uh, three annotations, you get better results. So like if you want to do this kind of annotation and then linearize, do you think it will help the LSTM or will it be the same? Well, I don't know. One experiment I did was I concatenated the constituency uh, representation and the dependence representation if you take the trendy generation and I put them together as a one representation for a tree and trained on a model on that. It didn't help, but I don't know whether it could help for dependency parsing. If the if you say constituency parse trees are subject the um, superset of dependency trees, then dependency trees may not help, but the other way may help. Okay, thanks. So I want to jump into the bay from that previous question, <laughs> not the last question. Um, and. Um, there's a long tradition um, of trying to do parsing without looking at the words. I think of it like, you know, no come on, no hands. Um, and uh, it makes no sense as far as I can see. That is, um, um, if, if there are a bunch of constructions, which we, which we call the Catalan constructions, where you have as, num as many parse trees as there are binary trees you could draw over the leaves. A conjunction, PP attachment, obvious cases. And it's been known for a long, long time that depending on what words you put in those things, you get different answers from people. And so if you ignore the only features that could possibly be useful, then you're going to you know, behave a chance. 
how could you possibly do that? And yet, so we keep seeing people trying to do that. But it, you've got to look at the words. I said, yeah, you did. Yeah, right. I. And, and <laughs> that's why you're getting good results, and the people who don't do that get bad results. I trained the uh, model on trees where words were replaced by aspects, and you did really bad. Yeah, right. I mean, like, why is this surprising? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's surprising that it works. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's thank the speaker.